Hear me, all of you, and understand. You no longer have to be in the habit of getting together. Just thinking about other people in your mind is the same as being physically present with them. Thus saith Adam Thompson. Are you shocked that I would say such a thing? From the pulpit, no less. Well, if you are shocked, that's good. You should be. Because that would contradict what God's Word says about how we are to relate to one another. In the book of Hebrews, it says that we should not give up the habit of meeting together. So not only should you be shocked if I issued a decree like that, but you should also not listen to it. When I teach the new member class here, one of the things that I always tell them is, you think that I am saying as the pastor something that goes against God's Word in my preaching or teaching? I want you to tell me about it. I want you to use God's Word to show me the error of my ways. Now, why do I say that? It's because all the authority that I have in the office of ministry comes from God and His Word. And as soon as I start speaking from my own Word, all the authority disappears because I'm not referring to God's Word any longer but my own. So as soon as I step out of that authority, you're no longer bound to obey or listen because it doesn't rely on God's Word. Now, this fact is true for all the teachers of God's Word except one. As our Old Testament reading talked about, when God gave His commandments and His laws to His people, He said, do not take away from this Word nor add to it, for it's God's Word. Only He can speak on its behalf. This is why Paul would always say that whether it doesn't really matter who preached it to you as long as it is the gospel. Well, this truth brings us to our text in Mark chapter 7 for today. Now, if you recall, last week Jesus issued a shocking statement to the Pharisees about how they were leaving behind God's Word in favor of the traditions of men. Well, this week He goes even further relying on His own divine authority directly on the heels of that teaching, He now is going to change, to add to and to take away from the commandment of God. He's the only one that is allowed to do this, for that command given in the Old Testament wasn't for Jesus, but for the people of God, not God Himself. So he's actually going to issue a new teaching today. Now, if the disciples and Pharisees were shocked when Jesus tells them that they've incorrectly interpreted God's law, you can imagine what the reaction is going to be when he just writes something new entirely. So Jesus today, in his divine authority, as I sort of snarkily put at the beginning of my sermon today, is actually establishing a new law and getting rid of some of the old ones. So what exactly is he doing? What is he changing? Well, he doesn't mince words. It's right away there at the beginning of our gospel section today. He says, hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Now, to our modern ears, especially ears that have probably heard this text a few times throughout our lives, these words don't sound groundbreaking, scandalous, the sort of thing that just blows apart your life. But that's exactly what it was when Jesus said it. This would have been an extremely scandalous thing to say. At first, you might be wondering why. Well, Mark clarifies, in case we missed it, a few verses later when he says that what Jesus has done here is that He has declared all foods clean. See, what Jesus has actually done is He's just overturned the entire system of clean and unclean foods that God Himself lays down in Leviticus chapter 11. In that chapter, it says that God commands His people concerning what they eat, and the purpose of these commands are so that they may not be unclean or defiled, but holy as He is holy. Now, this would explain perhaps why in the next verse after Jesus sort of makes this decree, the the disciples come back to Him a little bit later after the crowds have left and they're like, 
what was that? Right? And they're not saying it like they didn't hear it, I think. They're probably saying it like, did he really say that? I'm sure you meant something else. Because they would never think that Jesus is going to change the rules with God, despite the fact that that is precisely what He came to do. So they say, then Jesus responds to them when they ask this question. He says, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. Now, in a society that prized adherence to the law and external sources of uncleanness, you can probably imagine that this would seem not only shocking, but maybe after thinking about it for a little bit, it would eliminate a lot of problems, right? Jesus is saying, the stuff that comes in, I tell, all right, bring on the bacon. But it's not quite that simple. If the things outside of me don't make me unclean, Jesus intensifies the problem. He reveals its true nature and the sinister depth at which we are held by it. I brought up a, uh, a picture here for you to look at um, that makes me laugh every time I see it. Just follow your heart. False. The heart is deceitful above all things. Follow Jesus. That's Dwight from the office. But somebody made a meme and he has all these declarative statements. But this is one that is, lies at, no pun intended, the heart of the matter in our gospel reading today. You see, in verse 20, Jesus continues, if it isn't the stuff that's outside of us, then, then where's the problem lie? What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. All right, you can take that off. Now, as the disciples are listening to this teaching, it brought to my mind the line from Peter in John 6 that we meditated on a few weeks ago. After a particularly hard teaching of Jesus, which for the disciples at the time, this would have been very difficult because Jesus is changing something that God had said prior. And this is the beginning of what they'll come to understand are very important changes, but this one is difficult to hear because it makes it so that we have no excuse. The things that make us unholy and unrighteous, we can't blame them on external factors. We can't blame them on things that happen to us, but instead Jesus quite bluntly says they come from within. And so when we hear things like this, I think we echo the same thing that Peter says to Jesus after he talks about eating his body and blood as the bread from heaven, and a bunch of his disciples leave him, and he turns to the twelve and says, are you going to leave as well? And Peter says, where are we going to go? You are the Son of God. And in other words, He has the authority to do this. Where else can we turn to for the words of life? Thus far, we've considered the real gravity of what Jesus teaches here. He is, by relying on His divine authority as God's Son, changing the nature of the relationship that you and I have with God. Now, at first... It seems like bad news because He's plumbing the depths of our sin. He's intensifying it to such a degree we just want to throw up our hands and say, well, what can we do about this? Because when it was something outside of us, okay, we could just keep that out. But if it's already inside, what hope do we have? You see, before with the sacrifices and the food purity, law, food purity laws that God gave His people, He was doing something temporary, something to maintain in order to stave off the temporary effects of sin, but this was always done as a precursor, a foreshadowing to what Christ has come to do and is beginning to teach His disciples and us today. 
that He is the coming Savior, the Messiah, the Holy One of God. Now, when He arrived, He was going to do something new that had never been done before. Now, necessarily, that meant everything associated with the old covenant way of keeping us holy before God is about to change. And today in Mark 7, we hear the beginnings of this real change in Jesus. The key change is that our relationship with God is no longer going to be defined by rules and the keeping of rules. That's what it was until we got to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. That is why when you read the Old Testament, it says, if you keep my commandments and statutes then. But there's only one problem with that. The law of God didn't go deep enough. It turns out that the law protects us from the external consequences of the flesh, but it can't fix the real problem. The real problem is that you and I need a new heart. A lesson my father taught me when I started to study to become a pastor came to my mind as I was preparing for this sermon. He taught me to remember as a, a pastor, especially when I'm tempted in frustration, when I feel like people just aren't understanding. He reminded me that the law doesn't change hearts. Only the gospel can do that. So as much as I might want to tell you what to do or how to do it, that's not enough. That doesn't deal with the real problem. And this is the truth that Jesus has come to deal with. He has come to give you and I a new heart. Gone are the days when we can blame our problems on external influences, avoiding problematic things while still perhaps is a wise decision. It's not going to help make you holy in the eyes of God. Instead, we need something that the rules can't help us with. We need a new relationship with God. That's exactly what Jesus has come to do. That is exactly what the gospel does. It gives us a new relationship with God. You see, our old relationship was defined by the laws that He had given us and asked us to keep those commandments and statutes. Yet from the beginning of that covenant with God, He knew what Jesus was coming to do. He knew that to redeem His people, something more than a good and righteous law was going to be needed because the problem was worse than we thought. In the person of Jesus Christ, the new thing has come. It is the restoration of a right relationship. So if you wanted to summarize the change that Jesus is making in the gospel reading today, or really the change He's beginning to reveal to His disciples, you could say that He's exchanging rules for a relationship, rules for a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now, you all are pretty familiar with God's Word, and you know there are many times that Jesus intensifies the understanding of the law. He does that in the Sermon on the Mount most famously, right? So just to take an example, the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. At first blush, seems like, well, that one's easy. And then Jesus says, but if you've had hate in your heart for someone, you're guilty of breaking this commandment. And then we're left despairing. What can we do when what defiles us comes out of our own heart? And He does that on purpose because He wants you to die to self. He wants you to despair of any hope that you're going to place in your own doing of right deeds. For He knows that's not enough. And in despairing of your own efforts, the gospel comes into play to draw your eyes and your feet after Jesus. In the recognition that it is an impossible task to save ourselves, today He's beginning to re reveal the full purpose of His mission, that He is going to do the thing that we cannot, that He will fully restore His sinful people to a right relationship with God by giving us a new heart to deal with the sinful and defiled heart of man once and for all, to make you holy as He is holy, clean and pure through no deeds of your own, but through the deeds of your Savior Jesus and the perfect relationship, one as a son to a father 
that He gives you in His death and resurrection. So to close, I will, as is my call to do, echo the words of God that we have received in Jesus, to hear the blessed truth of the gospel and understand. So I say to you, hear me, all of you, and understand, as it says in Romans chapter 6, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God which passes our human understanding Guard your hearts and minds in this new thing, this gospel, and the promise that it brings you a new heart and makes you right with God. May that sustain you throughout the spiritual warfare and difficulties of this life until He comes again to make everything new. Amen.